Hi everyone, in this video I'm going to be showing you how I made this environment piece with cycles in Blender 2.81. Before we begin, you can download the file for free from the link in the description. So the first thing I'm going to do is talk a bit about volumetrics. Something you might immediately notice in the image is that there's quite a lot of grain. And yes, before you ask, this is due to a low sample count, but yes, it is intentional. It's actually ridiculously easy to remove this kind of noise in Blender now using the denoise node in the compositor. But I like this effect because I think it gives the image some texture, and it also matches up well with the small surface imperfections on the sphere, as well as the dirt effects coming off of the terrain. The volume in this scene actually originates from a 3D object rather than the world. We can see the object here, and if I open up the material nodes, then you can see how it's just a principled volume shader. I've done it inside of a cube rather than the world for a couple of reasons. Number one is because sun lamps don't really react too well with world volumes in cycles, and number two is because it simplifies the scene. For example, when we're moving around the scene in the rendered viewport like this, we only have to render what's inside of the cube, so it gives us some extra performance when using the rendered viewport for prototyping. I'm going to go into the camera view, and if I click on one of the lamps, notice that the color is not white, and nor is it the same color as the volume. There are two reasons for this color difference. Number one is that it allows for a slight color gradient across the scene, and number two is that through experimentation, I found that offsetting the colors between the light sources and the volume is a good way to be more precise when choosing the volume's color. If I go and open the color for the lamp, you'll see that we're staying close to the white center, and that's because we're trying to maintain this dull look. Whatever we choose for the scene lights, this color will mix with the volume's dull bluish gray color, and that will offset it. When trying to get an atmospheric look like this, it's good practice not to go too over the top with vibrancy, and that's something I actually struggle with because I like using strong colors in my work. Okay, so let's start talking about the contents of the scene. In the final image, you can see these dust particles to give the impression of dirt being picked up and carried away by the wind. This could have been added afterwards by painting over an original render, but I decided to make them part of the scene so we could get this grainy effect over the top of them. If we go over to the 3D viewport, you can see a few different planes for these dust images. And if we look at the material nodes for this, you can see that a transparent and a diffuse shader are being used to get the effect. The alpha channel of the input texture is used as the factor value of the mix shader node. But this is definitely not the only way to display transparent images on planes in the 3D scene. If we quickly move over to this upper blend file, then I can demonstrate this for you. Notice here that we have a basic scene with a plane and a point light. In the material nodes for the plane, we have the same setup as before, but this time there's an emission shader as well as a diffuse shader. This is so we can compare the different behaviors. See how with the diffuse shader plugged in, the texture will react with the point light in the rendered view. But if I swap the shader with the emission, then it will stop reacting with the light source. The emission shader acts as its own light source, and what this means is that you can have complete control over the light and color levels. This is really useful for when you want additive scene details that are disconnected from the regular scene lighting. An emission shader in this case is really useful for creating both subtle and strong effects. In terms of subtle effects, an example could be dust particles or fog that you don't want to be overexposed by nearby light sources. In terms of strong effects, an example could be vibrant neon signs that are stuck on the side of buildings. You would use a diffuse shader, or any other shader that's light reactive like a principal BSDF shader, for textures that you want to interact with the scene lights. An example could be sheets of paper near a fire. Just for reference, this is what the image textures from my scene look like by themselves. I put these together really quickly using the default brushes in Krita, and if you don't know what Krita is, it's open source digital painting software, and I highly recommend checking it out. If you download this file from the link in the description, I've made sure to package the image textures inside of the blend file, so you won't have to do any extra setup yourself. Now in regards to the floating sphere, I've given it some basic surface imperfections to give the roughness some variety. Now the way I've done this is very simple. If I go over to the object material nodes, you can see how it's just a noise texture plugged into a color ramp node, which is eventually plugged into the roughness input of a principled BSDF shader. The multiply node will let us control the intensity of the effect. The lower the value, the more reflective the sphere will be. Another thing you might notice while looking around the scene is that our character is floating in the air, but why is this? Well, it's because the ground is displaced via adaptive subdivision using material nodes rather than a regular displace modifier. The reason for this is because it will let me be able to rapidly prototype new types of topography by just manipulating material nodes. If you've watched my recent video on Node Vember, then you'll be familiar with the potential of node-based displacement. Of course, this does make it a bit difficult to precisely place the character in the scene, and it means that we will have to go into the rendered viewport to know exactly where to place the feet. But a way to make the viewport more responsive is to hide the volume while we're looking around. Another tip for this is that if there are any objects that you're not going to change anymore, then you can put them in a separate collection to make it easier to hide and unhide them all at once. Okay, so I think that's where we're going to leave it for this video. Don't forget to download the file for free from the link in the description. If you found the video interesting, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. You can also follow me on social media to stay up to date, and join our Discord server to take part in discussions and share your work. So thanks for watching, have a great day, and I'll see you next time.